uh, and uh, it's an English speaker. Uh, Cass Lemons works at Spotify uh, on their uh, mobile division as a customer. He's in charge of uh, the overall quality and the perform uh, platform consistency. Uh, he also uh, works with improving the design language. He's here today to ask us a question. It's if we're scientists or artists. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I think Soph deserves another round of applause because she's been amazing at her presentation. So if she's here, I don't know if she's here. Um, she's been working with us for uh, I don't know how long now. It, it feels like forever, and she's fantastic. Like we can give her anything, and she just gets it done. Like it's a fantastic person to work with. So um, well done, you guys, for educating her and those things. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, I am indeed the platform designer for mobile at Spotify. I look mostly at iOS, secondary Android, um, and I want to talk a little bit about the kind of struggles I, I go through every day uh, working at Spotify. Um, um, but before I start talking about that, um, I need to start with a confession. Um, I'm scared um, every single day. And I've been scared um, every day since I've been starting to work in the digital industry. So from the moment I graduated and I started actually working, there hasn't been a day where I actually felt comfortable with what I was doing. And to give you a bit of background on that, um, this is what I used to be, do be doing before I I used to work in advertising agencies, and I worked on a lot of apps for brands. I worked for brands like Samsung, New Era, Louis Vuitton. Um, we did stuff for London 2012. Back um, and that was, all, it was a lot of fun. You could work on a lot of different platforms. You can work on a lot of different styles. You can work on a lot of different concepts. Um, but it was very hard to actually learn for designing. And the reason why was because when you're working for an advertising, timing and budget is always very limited. So there's hardly any time to do user research, to make sure that you're collecting data on anything. God forbid you would have the time to do an iteration on your app, like a next version on it. Um, and there was definitely never, ever time to do an A-B test. So everything we designed was basically going with the first thing we designed, thinking it was good, signing it off with the client, and then pushing it out. And I'll be honest, most of these, they completely failed. Most of them, they, they didn't work at all. They didn't get the amount of people that we wanted to have on the app. They didn't keep people in the app. It, it didn't work. And the problem there was, like, even, like, we knew it didn't work, but we couldn't really tell why. Was it because the marketing went wrong? Was it because my information architecture was wrong? Was it because the designer used the wrong colors or didn't have enough contrast? We couldn't tell. There was no way of knowing. And that was very frustrating. Um, so I decided to join a product company uh, and uh, so I joined Spotify um, about a couple of years later. Uh, and here's a company that's about five to six years old. So you're looking at a company that has one product uh, across multiple platforms, and they've been having it for a very long time. Um, they've been having it uh, for five years, so there's data of, of, of people using it for five years. There's all infrastructure to support it. There's A-B testing. There's a user research team. Everything was there. So when I joined, that was very exciting. I started to look into the data warehouse where you could collect data, where you can see how people were using it. I was working together with Rochelle, who's the head of design. She's the go-to person when it comes to data and design. She knows everything about it. She's, she's very helpful, and it was, it's fantastic to work with her. Um, and so I started to, to, to learn as much as I could so I could support my designs. But even then, um, working on these platforms is, is still very, very scary. And the reason why is because you're dealing with a necessity. Music is still a necessity. It's been there long before Spotify was there, and it will be here with us for a very long time after this moment. Um, and people use music in all kinds of ways. They use it to make a sad moment a bit more doable. They, make it, they use it to make a really nice moment even better. They use it for parties. They use it for funerals. They use it for, for weddings, for just studying, for everything. And it's become a necessity. I don't think anybody would like to live without music here. Um, and you can see that in our, in our user base. We have about 50 million daily active users. So think about it. That's five times Sweden of people who use our app on a day-to-day -day basis, who stream at least three to five songs every single day. So you don't want to play with that number. You don't want to let that number go down. Um, and design is one of those things that really influences the amount of users we have. So it's very, very scary to actually make decisions that could influence those 50 million daily active users. And... Mistakes still happen, and, and it's not 
uncommon for us that we do mistakes. The reason why we do mistakes is we're still in a very competitive market. Um, Spotify is not the only way to listen to music. We have streaming companies that compete with us directly. We have indirect competitors such as YouTube, such as even the radio in your car. Um, and so we always want to make sure that we're innovating on these things. But when you're innovating, you can't test many things. If you're doing something like what we launched a couple of weeks ago, which was a touch preview thing, if you want to launch that, you can't launch that to, let's say, half of our users. Then we leak it. Then we have a new feature and people know about it and then we can't really show off with it. So what we need to do is we need to launch it to a really small subset of users, maybe 1% to 5%, and probably even tell them that we're going to launch it and then they're under an NDA and that they can't tell anybody about it. And then if everything goes right with, those, with that 5%, if, if the numbers are correct, then we can launch it. So often we launch with a, what we call a big bang, and that's not very safe because there's often no time to actually test it on of people and make sure everything runs. So often these things actually don't work and then we need to scale back and change things. Another reason why things go wrong is because we are a very big company. A lot of the things that go in here, we move very fast. Every release, a lot of new stuff is in that app. And often those things are like one of the new things that we added might have never seen, been seen by, by a designer. So often when I <laughs> release and I go through it and I start testing it, I see things that I'm like, how did, how did that get in there? Like, I don't, I don't even remember looking at that. Um, so that's another reason why a lot of these things go in. Sorry, I'm just going to make sure my, rem my remote works. Um, and the last thing um, that makes it have a lot of mistakes is Spotify has always been a very technically led company. The design team two years ago was half of the size that we are today. And now we're in this point where we're actually starting to be a bit more design driven. But before that, it was all technical. It was all that everything worked, which has paid us off very well because our app is still one of the biggest streaming apps in the world and it still works very well. So it has paid off to be technically that first. But um, a lot of these decisions that we're making, a lot of the choices we're making are often because of technically, technical uh, limits that we have. So a lot of these things cause us to have mistakes in there, which plays with those numbers. And that really doesn't make me feel comfortable. That is what gives me gray hair and what makes me bold um, earlier than anybody else. So, but apparently, that's OK. Because um, John Maeda, he says that the only thing that creative people should be comfortable in is their own doubt. Because he says that if you're creating something that's very small and significant, something like Spotify when you're designing it from the beginning, the, the, the chances that you do that right from the first time are very, very small. The only thing you can actually use to build those things is your own doubt, is, is building on what you know and what you might not know, and just build on there and see what happens. And you have to have faith in the fact that you're having a design that might impact a lot of people. So when I say this, I wonder to myself, like, how, how can I be more comfortable in, in my own doubt? And how can I make sure that what I do has a good likelihood of being successful? So when I design, um, I'm often in between two fields. And you can probably get art and science. If you know that you have the, the angel and the devil on your shoulders, that, those are the two for me on a day-to-day basis. Um, and the reason why I choose art and science is because if you look at the characteristics of the two professions, we, we have similar characteristics, and we actually the, we often apply to both. If you look at it, art serves the few. Like you might have an exhibition of art that you serve to only maybe a million people in your in the tour that you do. You might have a chef, you might have your restaurant. In, in the whole of your, your restaurant, you might have served, again, maybe a million people. Um, but science serves a lot more people. You might find a recipe for a headache, and that all over the world, and everybody can use it to get rid of their headache. It has a much, much bigger impact. And it's the same for us. We serve 50 million daily active users, five times Sweden. That's a lot of people, obviously. That's a lot more than probably a restaurant can handle. Um, but we also try to optimize for very small use cases. We always try to look at like what are small groups in those 50 million users that actually are big enough to give them attention. Um, so we try to optimize for those. Um, science is about creating an effective solution. If you buy a pill against a headache, you don't really care if it tastes right. You don't really care if the packaging was beautiful. You don't really care if, um, if the shape of the pill looks tasty. You just take it, and if it takes away the headache, that's good. That's an effective solution. It works. But when you go to a restaurant, 
Food might be really good, but if your waiter is a little bit rude to you, or if the atmosphere is really boring, you're not going to go there again. It's all about the experience. It's all about the pleasure you get from going there and having a nice waiter and being having good food. And it's the same for us. Obviously, Spotify needs to be effective. It needs to work. You need to press play, and it should play. And that's one of the things that we've been investing in in the very beginning, which is why Spotify was always so fast. If you would double-click a song, it would start immediately. There would be no buffer or anything. So we need to make sure that we keep that promise. But on the other hand, we have a massive catalog, and it shouldn't be an experience of browsing a database. Nobody wants to browse like table after folder, looking into every single album and trying to find the right song. No, it needs to be a nice experience, something pleasurable, like homework. Um, where science iterates on what they know, art doesn't really care about it. They like to change rapidly. Um, science always works on what was known before and try to build on that and try, try to make new um, discoveries based on, on the research that's been done before. For art, you can go anyway. There's been really drastic changes in art movements. And for us as well, like obviously we iterate on it. We like to change our app based on what we know from the data and what we can see in there. But often we need to be a little bit more um, disruptive. We need to be a bit more uh, innovative and just say, like, look, we're going to go for this change. Again, this is what I talked about before. This is a big bang theory um, where you just really quickly and you might not know if you've done something right or if people might like it. Um, so where science is about testing and finding proof and asking the right questions, art is about creating your own taste and following a lot. We find a lot that we have we over, that we have our own brand, that people recognize it and like Spotify because of our experience that we have all the music in the world, because another competitor could have that tomorrow. So whenever I'm designing, um, and it's a very difficult balance to keep. Um, so for the designers in the room, like, Ask yourself, like, where would you be? Are you more on the, on the science side or more on the art side? I know for myself that I am more on the science side. And the reason why is because I'm, I'm coming more from a technically-led uh, background as well. Like, I've been doing computer engineering. It's, for me, very comfortable. I like to go there because I know that I can trust the data. But I tend to push myself to the art side and say, OK, I, maybe I should really rely on my gut feeling, on my taste, on how I see things. So forget that for a second. Um, I'm going to take you all on a trip. Um, all of you, we're going to go to Spain. We're going to go to a very nice restaurant a little bit outside of Barcelona. And you're, we're going to have dinner there. And you can all expense it on me in the flight as well. I'll give you my savings. Um, what you're going to get in that restaurant is about 30 in three hours. All bites, just to feel it for the sake of the dust, and it did before. It's called. It's actually uh, on the coast, a bit away from Barcelona. Uh, it's one of the best restaurants in the world, and the chef is one of the most renowned uh, chefs in the world. If you would look up all the best chefs currently, the best chefs in the world, um, they probably would have done a part of their education with him with, in this restaurant. Now, the interesting part about this is that it's only open for six months. The other six months, they close down the main restaurant, they go to the chef, they go to Barcelona, close to the market, where can, they can get fresh ingredients every day. They take one ingredient and they just experiment with it. They try to cook it and marinate it and do all the different treatments on it as much as possible, just to learn. They're trying to be objective recipes at either. They're not making dishes in those other six months. Documenting, they're just doing research. Um, and what you see here is they're just taking the ingredients. They're like, okay, if we marinate this with wine, if we marinate this with oil, if we freeze this, if we put this in the oven, if we boil this, what happens to it? And all of that gets documented. They write down what it looks like, what kind of viscosity it has, what kind of thing it has. Um, and then they put that in a huge file, a huge Word doc, where you can see, like, okay, if we take and we treat it in this way, then we get something that tastes like this and it looks like this. If it tastes strong or weak, it doesn't really matter if it tastes good or bad. Obviously, tasting bad stuff shouldn't be there. But um, with a certain degree, they're being very objective and they're just trying to document it. And after those six months, when they've done their research, like the last couple of months of those six months, they go back to the restaurant um, outside of Barcelona and they're starting to make the research and find the taste when eat there. And those things are. So um, so different than anything else. Those, that's why they're the best taste you've ever tasted before. Putting those into those dishes, that is what makes um, Bui El Bui. It is the taste, is the style, is their art that they're creating. Um, this is a documentary about them, and, and this is the last part where they actually find a recipe. This is a couple of ingredients 
from the research they did six months before. And um, to very nice progress, better. the science of doing research leads into the dishes they make and into the art, into what El Bui makes El Bui. Now, at Spotify, definitely not at all that El Bui would serve, uh, also not the prize that they would serve. But uh, we have, we, we're very inspired by this, and we're trying to apply similar things to, to what they're doing. We have two things to help designers design for us. They're principles and guidelines. What the El Bui is, what the dishes are, they our principles. Um, El Bui uses to experiment the different ingredients. Those are our guidelines. And I'll give you a quick example of both of them so you can get a sense of, of how it works. Um, our principles are based on Tokyo. Um, by Tokyo because a lot, of the, a lot of the values that that city has, that lives with. One of the first guidelines we have is content first. I don't know if anybody knows Shiro, the sushi chef. He's about in his 80s, I think, and he has done, the only thing he does is make And his son has been responsible for the rice for 50 years because he was not ready for the fish yet. So he's very, very good at making the best sushi in the world. It's all about sushi. And for us, it's all about music. We're trying to use him as an inspiration and make sure that, um, that we, we are content for music has a beat. If you would go there, you would feel it. That's what Spotify should express as well. If you open feel that it's alive. That's why we have the... Everybody know those gardens in Japan with the rocks and the sand around it? Pot by it just looks peaceful. It looks very as if it always was at. It looks peaceful. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do as well. We put all the effort to use it that it's very effortless, that you can listen to music. Get familiar. Um, you've probably seen personalities, but they also know how to dress up and do as well. We're trying to... We know who you are taste you have so we can with uh, with the competitors. We like to really stay authentic to music and to um, instead of, for example, relying on people. And for the Swedes, the last one, Lagom, is just right. Music is always in tune. It's always tuned perfectly. And that's what Spotify should be as well. It shouldn't be too much. It shouldn't be too less. It should be just right. And you can see that they're very, very high level. Um, abstract. Very good when we're trying to introduce features or say like, okay, if we're launching something or discover, how does that correlate to these guidelines? Now, on the other hand, uh, sorry, on these principles, on the other hand, we have a design language and our design language is called GLUE, which stands for Global Language. And this is the thing that I'm responsible for most of the time. On one part is a whole library of components. And this is what you see here. This is a subset. And these components are puzzle pieces that designers could use to create their view. The reason why we have them is because we want to make our app consistent. I am responsible for looking at the components we have, so that we have over 100 components that all of you need to get used to, but that we try to keep it so you know what happens when you press the card, so you know what happens when you toggle. Um, so that's what we're trying to do with, with our design language. And in this library of components, we also need to educate designers saying this is those, because obviously they can be in millions of ways. That's why we have an internal website um, at Spotify where they can go and they can learn about how to use buttons or how to use cards. Um, I mostly work with these components on an individual level. I look at them as, as they are, like the actual itself. I, I like to look at them as El Bui looks at their ingredients. Um, for those who use a mobile app, and I hope that's a lot of um, very familiar to you, this is a, a couple of track rows that we have across the app as much between the different lines. What if you would make the font a little bit smaller? What if you would make everything a little bit smaller, the circle around the content, and, and make everything a bit more compact? How does this relate to the design guidelines? More authentic, or is it maybe going because you need to, you know, like make your eyes a bit, make the hierarchy a little bit more, use colors, for example. What at the artwork of the album that, that the song is on? Is this maybe more content first? Does this bring out the content? One? Or confuse users uh, that this is a track row and there's a more metadata line. Is the last eight of them are necessarily using the app, but they're just experiments we're running just to learn at what we control. What is the impact of doing these? Can we know what we're controlling? So if we would these, does any of the of the those changes um, reflect 
Do people use the app more? Do they play more? Do they tap it more? All of those things we control and we should know about it so we can learn how to combine them just as we combine them to make amazing recipes. Um, so whenever I'm designing, um, I try to keep a guideline to myself, which is that obviously Spotify should create and express our own taste. We should be all the guidelines, all the principles that we have, we should express them as much as possible, but we should adapt gracefully. We need to make sure that we understand what components we have, what we can learn from them, and how we can change them for the better so that they can be combined better. Okay, I'm going to send you on another trip. Um, this time we're going to go a bit beyond Europe, a bit of space and time, uh, through wormholes and um, these are scenes from the movie Interstellar from Christopher Nolan. If you haven't seen it, I recommend seeing it. Um, it's a fantastic movie. But the interesting part about it is, I don't know if you know, but Christopher Nolan likes to make his movies as, um, as uh, how do you say it, realistic. Um, so he doesn't really use green keys. He often, like, in, if, for those who have seen Interstellar, that scene where there's like sandstorms, blowers with sand that blows it on the set. Like, it's not CGI, it's not just a small little subset, it's like being blown with sand, too. Um, he tries to be real realistic, and when he needs to make CGI, such as all the scenes you see in a movie where there's actually space, he even wants to be as realistic as he too. So what he did was to, to design these kind of black holes and wormholes, he didn't make them look cool like most of the other movies do. He went to a scientist, Kip Thorne, who's the best scientist when it comes to these things, and told him, look, you tell me what science says that a black hole should look like, and I will work with it. Instead of just designing it in the best way that it would work for him, camera points and lighting and scenes, he actually went to him and said, like, look, you figure it out. You tell me what science is and how it would be realistically, and I will adjust my camera points. I will adjust my light, adjust my scenes so that it works with that black hole. So it's interesting, he gives a part of his creativity away to science, which is, for some people, might not even be as creative as you might think. Um, so it's the intuition of being realistic that really is, is allowing science to control a part he wants to design. And the interesting part about it, this is not only art that becomes better because they use science, science becoming better because they were introduced. Um, a lot of the, and not a lot of the work that Kip thought black hole uh, research actually was true research for just the six papers came out of this that are express, uh, to explain more things about black holes and it has nothing to do with the video but it's because it was asked to do it came about it's a beautiful marriage of science and art in these things um, now at Spotify again far from the quality of interest or the, gen the, the being as genius as Christopher Nolan is uh, but we're looking at similar things when we launched Browse a couple of years ago now I think um, obviously, we had genres in there. We had rock, we had hip-hop, we had soul. That makes sense. Genres have been with music since forever, way before we were there, so why wouldn't we have them? But we also added something called party, for example. We had other ones. We had chill, I think, and there was focus, maybe. Um, and these were basically buckets. Okay, so if you have a party, you can have a playlist with a lot of different genres in it. It doesn't really fit in hip-hop. It doesn't really fit in dance. It doesn't really fit in pop. So... Let's just create a subcategory for it where we can just dump those playlists in. Um, and so we launched with, I think, a lot of genres and a couple of these what we called moods. Um, and when we looked at the numbers, we saw that moods were actually being used as much, if not more, than the genres. Some moods were actually more popular than the most popular genres like rock and hip-hop. So we, we worked on that. We said, like, okay, this is interesting. Let's build on that. So if you would go to browse today, you would have dinner, you would have sleep, you would have travel. Those are not really genres as, in the, in the, in, as we understand genres. These are more moods. These are kind of um, times of the day that you might need this music. And this has been very, very successful. And it's defining a lot of what we're doing ahead of us. Uh, so again, here, we're trying to take a little bit of the creativity away from us. We never expected that this would happen. We never anticipated or designed it in a way that we wanted this to happen. But we went with it. It turned out. And we said, like, OK, so we're giving a bit of the control to the user. You guys tell us what you like. It comes back to us and we adapt to it. Nolan gives it back to science. It's tell me how it is and I'll adapt to it. And that's what he did. Um, another example is search. When I joined Spotify, um, this was the first thing I worked on. And search was very broken back then. I don't know if anybody remembers, but we had like three columns, which was tracks, albums, and artists. And then you had to type and then press enter. And then it was really slow and it was very confusing. Um, and so 
When we redesigned this, when I came in, the design team, sorry, the search team didn't have a designer for a couple of months, and they were very excited because they had a new backend system. It was amazingly fast, and they wanted to, to do a lot of things. They thought, this is great. We can actually have a destination where we can do a lot of really cool stuff, and it could be really cool UI, and it's going to be the best search experience ever. But then we did research. We looked at not only our own search on other platforms, but we also looked at search from people that we knew. Like We had people from Netflix who had worked on search before. We had people from Facebook who had worked on search before. And what we realized not only from talking to them, but also from doing user research, was that search is mainly a tool from getting from A to B. If you want to get to Michael Jackson, you go to search, you type in Michael Jackson, you type in Michael Jackson, you're in Michael Jackson. That's what it's for. You don't really care about all the pages in between. You just want to get to, to Wacko Jacko. Um, so that's what we optimize for. We completely optimize for speed. The whole view of these things is pretty boring. It's just rows of stuff, really. It's not a view. But it works. You tap, you get immediate results. There's a top result you're looking for. You can tap it immediately. And we actually lowered the amount of taps needed to get to your results uh, instantly. And it's been a very successful um, uh, product ever since. So this is, again, giving a part of the creativity away to what people tell us that it needs to be. It needs to be fast. That's the only thing we care about. OK, let's adapt to it. Um, so another guideline I keep to myself is, obviously, the product should be able to grow. And we should give it an, a direction to go to. We shouldn't stack it into what we know. But we need to follow its desire. And the desire might be something that we don't really, we don't really know, but that the data can tell us. Uh, so again, this is the artist and the scientist talking with each other. Like The artist obviously wants the art, the taste, the product to grow. But the scientist says, like, yeah, but make sure that you listen to the user and make sure that you understand what's happening. Um, that's the second one. One more trip. Um, can anybody guess where this is? Any guesses? I'm not saying if it's on Earth or in space or anywhere else. Just random guesses. I know it's 9 a.m., but come on. Nobody? No wild guess? Is it a place in your head? <laughs> Good try, but no. I'll give you that. It's an actually existing space. Maybe an ice cave? Could be, yeah, you're getting close ish. A thing in the kitchen. A thing in the kitchen. That's a bit further away. Um, it's actually an exhibition. This is the Guggenheim. And this is an art piece from James Turrell, who likes to work with light and space. Um, and the thing that's interesting about it is he, what he does when he does an exhibition, he goes to the place where the exhibition would be held, he looks at the architecture, he looks at the shape of the room, he looks at the light that comes in and is like, okay, I'm going to do this here. And this is completely, for example, somebody who does paintings who just says, like, here's my batch of paintings, please put them in this order and hang them up in your, in your, um, in your exhibition hall. This is another one of, of his works, and I've been in one of those, and it's very, very surreal. You don't really know how far you, you can walk in this room, or, or where the walls are, or where the light comes from. Um, it's a very, very artificial experience. He's really good at this is Dan Flavin. Um, this is the work of Guggenheim. Uh, he's a bit more concrete in where the light comes from, but still, it's a very nice experience. And again, he does the same. He looks at the Guggenheim, looks at the architecture, looks at the light, and says, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this nice rainbow flow that you can walk by. Now, if you want to appreciate this piece of work, you wouldn't walk down the alleys and just look at every single light. Because that would just be, that you're looking at signs basically. You're looking at electrodes emitting light and those things. Not that I know anything about signs. Um, the only way you can really appreciate this is by taking a step back and by looking at it almost from the point of view that these photos were taken. And look at it from a holistic point saying, this is actually, this is where the beauty comes out. Um, this is another example. You wouldn't walk down every single light to appreciate it. You need to look into this point of view and look at what happens in the room when these kind of pieces of art are put in there. So this is, again, something that I see as a beautiful marriage between art and science. It's an artist who expresses their art by respecting science because he respects the architecture, the light that comes in, the material that's being used in these, in these rooms, um, and learns from that and then applies their art. So when we bring this back to Spotify, um, 
with the platform team, we like to create systems. We like to create systems for everything. We have a system for buttons. We have a system for colors. We have a system for fonts. We also have a system for page structures. And page structures are really important. Just like the components are there for you to have a cognitively low-loaded uh, low experience where you can just get the components and you understand how they work, page structures are the same. You shouldn't have every single uh, that looks differently, so you need to know how to adjust to it. They should be familiar so you understand, like, oh, okay, I can do this on this page and I can do that on the other page. And so when we look at, at, at Spotify, we like to put every page in one of three buckets. The first one is a hub, which is the one you see on the left, on the right, um, or the left for you, which is, for example, browse. It could be your music. It's a place where you can go in and you can browse around and you can find something. The middle one is a basically a long list, probably based by time, where you can read stories. The last one is an entity page. Artists, albums, playlists, profiles, any of those. And what we do to make sure that all these, those uh, pages fit in there is we try to abstract it. Wireframes are a really good tool for this, but often a wireframe is even too detailed. We kind of abstract it even more, and up to the point that it's something very small that almost looks like a sketch. And that we do for every single page in the app. And then we look into like, okay, so we have this page and that page that on this are very similar, but they're still not really clear whether one is a hub or an entity page. We try to look at them from a holistic point and try to see how these things fit together and how we can make it easier for you to understand. So again, just like uh, Dan Flavin and Terrell, we'd like to take a step back and look at it holistically so we can make sure that our brand and our expression is expressed on all these pages in an easy way for you to understand. So the last um, guideline I always keep to myself, and this is something that I always look for when I'm, when I'm working with designers, is to slow down. You have to be very, very realistic when you're designing for a Spotify about your place in the app. Like, how much do you actually own and where do you fit into the whole process? A lot of the designers that, that we meet are people who really want to do something awesome with the two views they own, but it becomes such a um, strange experience when you go into it because it's so different from anything else we've seen in the app that you don't really know what it's for and you have to adjust to it and you have to learn to use the screen, which is uh, totally against what we should be doing. Um, it's also about being realistic about how many people use your app and, and the age of your app. I'd like to use the analogy that I think Rahul came up with. Um, if you're a brand new startup and you make an app, you can make mistakes. You're a little bit, you just got born, so you're like a little toddler. And if you would, for example, hit another baby, your mom might yell, you go up to your room, you might, have, you might cry for a night, but you're fine, like you can just keep going afterwards. If you're a grown up, if you're past 18, if you're 20, which is in, I guess, in startup years, five years, which is our age, if you would hit somebody, you get in trouble. Like, you, you, you probably have to pay a fee, you might get hit back, you might go to jail. You don't get away with it easily, it will cost you. And it's the same for us. We, we're at an age that we have to be very careful with the mistakes we're making because it will cost us. And that relates to the beginning in daily active users. We don't want to play with that number, so we have to be really realistic in making sure that what we add to the app actually fits in the app from a holistic point of view. So, um, I've shown you three projects. If we want to combine them all in one quote, I think this one is a really good one. Um, what begins with intuition is fueled by insight, and if you're lucky, we force each other. If you look at those three projects that I showed you, El Bully has of creating the most beautiful or amazing taste you've ever had in your life, but they're using research, six months of pure research, as an insight to fuel an intuition. Interstellar has the intuition of creating the most realistic science fiction movie you've seen, but they're using real science and data to get um, insight in those things. And Flavin and Terrell, they learn how light works, they learn how to flex in buildings so that they can create immersive experience, such as you've seen in the pictures. Now, none of these projects, they, they choose between art and science. None of them is on either art or science. They always make sure that they work together. So when I showed you the process in the beginning of my presentation where I had to choose between leaning or leaning on the art side, I don't really think that that's a sustainable model. I don't think this really works. I think as a product designer, you have to, re have to have respect for both the process of art and the process of science. You need to listen to both of them. Uh, and obviously, you should always follow your intuition, but you have to make sure that your intuition is getting fueled by insights. And that's where I think real product design comes about. That's what I aspire to be as a good product designer. 
I believe that there's a necessity for a product designer to understand both art and science. And I think that there is a process where both art and science can work together in the best way possible so that our intuition get better by getting insights from both of them. Um, I'm not there yet. I'm still a very young product designer. I've only been at Spotify for over two years. Um, but I'd like to come back in a couple of years and say, like, this process actually worked. I figured it out. I think this is going to work. Um, to me, this is one of the ways that I can start trusting my intuition a little bit better uh, and be a little bit less scared than I am today. So again, for the designers in the room, ask yourself, if you guys work on a design project or if you're working by yourself on a, on a design project, in discussions that you're having either with yourself or with your team, is there somebody who represents science and is there somebody who represents art in the room? And when they work together or when they talk together, do they actually work together? Do they try to make the best out of each other or do they constantly fight against and are you actually gaining your intuition by listening at your insights? Are you also capturing what you're learning? Or is it just getting it out there? With those questions, I'll leave you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, and I'm open for questions. Here you go. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We've, hopefully, if this works, we should have a question for you very soon. Okay, I'll have to read it over here. Um, we got a question. Uh, if you compare working uh, at an agency creating commercials, uh, how have your creative mind changed? Uh, do you still have the freedom to start from us at Spotify? That's a good question. Um, less at Spotify than obviously at agency work. I mean, in agency work, you're, you're getting a brief and you, you literally get a blank slate as well. There's not often that you get um, specific guidelines on them. Obviously, there's a brand to follow their brand guidelines, often their colors, often their fonts, but it's more free than at Spotify. That being said, I don't feel like it limits me in any way. Um, when, you're, when you're working as a product designer, you're working for a product of, of what you're designing is for having people to use it, whereas for an agency is probably getting people to buy something. And as soon as that's done, your work is over. Um, for Spotify, that's not really the case. So there's a lot more thought that needs to be put into how your product works, what the flows are, how people get through the experience, more than just making sure that it, it looks nice or you can start from a blank slate with no guidelines on colors or anything. Uh, and also another question. Uh, as an engineer, why did you decide to go into advertising to begin with? It's <laughs> a good question. Um, I've been on the verge between being a designer and, a, and an engineer. I've never been. I really like programming. I still do it a lot. I, I enjoy designing things and making sure that they, they work and people can use them. So it's always in, in between that battle, um, uh, balance rather. Um, the reason why I went for agency work was back then you had this really cool job title called creative technologist, uh, which is completely not necessary anymore, but that was the thing I went for. And it was interesting to actually understand how tech would work, how websites would work, how technology in general um, and program would work so that you can use that in the best way possible to get creative with things. And that has, has definitely helped when doing the work I've showed you at the beginning. And uh, last one, if, if you would add another angel on your shoulder, uh, besides uh, art and science, what would that angel be? Oh, that's a really tough question. Um, what would that be? I guess it would be some kind of magical thing that makes everything even faster than it is today. Um, I, the, the problem often is that uh, we often have to wait for data. So when you're designing something, often you, you just have to wait a couple of weeks until you can actually know if it works. And that's a long time. Uh, and if, if that would be like another angel on my shoulder would just whisper, it's like, it's working, then I can just keep going. Um, that's really possible, yes, unfortunately. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for you, I have a... Let's see if I can... Need some help? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's a vaccination kit donated in your name to help uh, children with measles and polio. Great. And it's also a chocolate bar from... Uh, at least my favorite place in town. All right. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.